Good afternoon, Tokyo, and uh, thanks, Peter Cheney, for that very effusive introduction that you just gave. And now you've got to do that, haven't you, really? Otherwise, uh, this uh, recording won't look too good. Um, I'm speaking from Durham because, unfortunately, owing to the vicissitudes of Brexit, the airfares shot up by, uh, it seemed to me, uh, more than 50%, thus putting it out of the departmental budget. And uh, I'm sure that's one of the less severe consequences of that um, calamitous decision. So I'm going to talk about improvisation and the aesthetics of imperfection. And this is a talk recorded in Durham on which there is no post-production or editing as befits the subject matter. Uh, it's an entirely imperfect recording done to the highest standards of the aesthetics of imperfection. And I'm going to start by talking about uh, some ideas put forward by um, a Swiss musician called uh, Alfred Zimmerlin. And uh, his ideas came to me because I wrote a sleep note for an album that he recorded on the, uh, it's by a trio called Kimmig Studer Zimmerlin, and it's coming out on Hatology shortly. And I sent him, as part of the sleep note, some ideas that I've had uh, for some time on the aesthetics of imperfection. And interestingly, he took exception to them in a fairly fundamental way, actually. Um, so I'll just quote, I'm going to read the paper because I'm not familiar enough with it really to do, to improvise. So it's not, this is not totally imperfect performance, I'm afraid. Um, so what he began by saying was, uh, when I put it to him that um, improvisation had an aesthetics of imperfection, he immediately replied, our music has nothing to do with imperfection. Uh, I could call it an aesthetic of making a piece of art in the moment, sculpting a sound directly, working on its components. Probably you could compose these complex sounds, but is it necessary? Composition has other aims and advantages. Working so directly on a sound is one of the qualities of free improvised music, along with collective time flow, collective energy, collective mobile forms. So these are, this is the view from uh, a musician who is, I suppose, well, he's actually, he is actually a composer, uh, so I would describe his compositions as, well, contemporary modernist composition, and he is an improvising musician, so he has a, you know, an interesting perspective on this. For him, improvisation and composition share the same aim. Uh, and here are some more quotes. Composition and free improvisation are two very different methods to lead you to the same goal to get as good and as lively a music as possible. Composition usually is a lonely solo, solo metier where you carefully reflect every note and every sound. You reflect it in verbal thinking and, imagination, and in imagination, and you have all the time in the world to do so. It is a slow process. In contrast, he continues, pre-improvisation is a collective work. All your decisions as a performer affect the decisions of the others. Obviously, we're assuming here that it's group improvisation as it usually is. I mean, obviously there can be solo improvisation. Um, you have a common time and a common space of expression in which to act in real time. This doesn't mean that an improviser reflects less than a composer, but they do it before and after the creation of the music. This way of thinking while creating is musical thinking in the purest sense a thinking in sounds. The only thinking that is possible in real time, thinking in words is much too slow. If you think in sounds, you think and create in the same moment. You get into a state of a collective musical energy, a flow, which creates the form of a piece, which in the end is as convincing as a composed form but different. So as I said, um, Zimmerlin was arguing against the view I put forward in a couple of articles in 1990 and 2000 and in a book after that, uh, influenced by Ted Joyer's use of the term aesthetics of imperfection. And the idea is that improvisation involves an aesthetics of imperfection. 
Now this contrasts with the common view that improvisation in musical performance is a kind of instant composition having lower artistic status than that of composed works. In an aesthetics of imperfection, the spontaneous product is valued over the finished product. Sorry, I should rephrase that. And in an aesthetics of imperfection, spontaneous process is valued over a finished product. While such an aesthetics is expressed most clearly in the work of improvising musicians, it is also necessary, I think, for the creation of a higher level of creative performance while following a score. And that's something I'll come back to uh, shortly. So for most of the world's music, for most of its history, um, music has been improvised in the broadest sense of improvised. The composer was the performer, if you like. But then in Western music, perhaps in the 17th century onwards, uh, obviously historians of music will dispute exactly when, the two roles became increasingly divided. The composer acquired a growing authority. During the 19th century, performers understood that they had to do exactly and only what the composer told them, or perhaps, shall we say, during the 20th century, maybe, because there were still meddlers in the early 20th century, or um, performers who thought they could alter the score, like Mengelberg did, um, the conductor Willem Mengelberg, I believe, with Mahler, and so on. Um, in the 20th century, this inspired a reaction from improvisers. And I'm not uh, exactly clear, I wouldn't um, want to make too many historical claims about the exact nature you know, of how this reaction occurred, but I think uh, certainly the developments of an aesthetic to imperfection in modern jazz are partly a reaction to the uh, authority of the composer in uh, classical music. I mean, there's some connection between those two um, situations. So, jazz and improvised music have their own aesthetic. Um, Ted Joyer, as I mentioned in The Imperfect Art, describes two rival aesthetics. The aesthetics of perfection emphasises the timelessness of the work and the authority of the composer. Ultimately, this is a Platonistic view regarding music as essentially abstract sound structures. The aesthetics of imperfection, in contrast, is consciously humanistic, valuing the event or process of performance. A humanistic approach treats music as a sounding, vibrating phenomenon and a performing art or entertainment. The Platonistic conception of perfectionist, in contrast, is non-participant and intellectualist and identifies a musical work with a written score. Humanism asserts the centrality of artistic criticism rather than scientific research or analysis to the understanding of art. Now, um, I reckon I'll be talking for 25 minutes maximum, if that's the aim anyway. So I'll pace my speaking accordingly. Um, so the idea of an aesthetics of imperfection appears paradoxical. How could imperfection be aesthetically valuable? And obviously Zimmerlin is worried about that, as indeed are other musicians that I've presented these ideas to. Part of the explanation lies in what I call, or what Derek Bailey calls, I think, the instrumental impulse, and that's essential to a humanistic aesthetics of imperfection. So then let's come on to the instrumental impulse. Actually, I think by the time of this conference that you are now at, uh, I will have, um, you'll be looking at a handout which I will have prepared. So um, we will now address the section called the instrumental impulse. In his book, Improvisation, Its Nature and Practice in Music, Free improvising guitarist Derek Bailey developed an aesthetics of imperfection um, and central to it is what he called the instrumental impulse. I mean, he didn't use the term in aesthetics of imperfection. As I said, that seemed to be coined by Ted Joyer. And he quotes saxophonist Steve Lacey as saying, the instrument, that's the matter, the stuff, your subject. Bailey states the thought as follows. The instrument is not just a tool, but an ally. It is not only a means to an end, it is the, a source of material, and technique for the improviser is often an exploration or exploitation of the natural resources of the instrument. 
Bailey, I think, takes the concept from Kurt Sachs's The World Springs of Music, which refers to the instrumental impulse as not a melody in a melodious sense, but an agile movement of the hands, which seems to be under the control of a brain centre, totally different from that which inspires vocal melody. Well, that's uh, speculation uh, in his case, of course. For John Blacking, kalimba tunes of the Nsenga exhibit recurring patterns of fingering, which combined with polyrhythm between the two thumbs, produce a variety of melodies. The theme is physical and not purely musical, uh, obviously depending on how you define purely musical. Um, and these are ideas that have been explored, I think, in Marco Ajo's recent book, Tangible in Music, The Tactile Learning of a Musical Instrument. From the beginnings of European free improvisation in the 1960s, musicians subjected their instruments to unprecedented interrogation in pursuit of the instrumental impulse. And that's shown in the work of the Swiss-German trio that I mentioned, Kimmich, Studer, Zimmerlin. Uh, this features Harold Kimmich on violin, Alfred Zimmerlin on cello, and Daniel Studer on bass. The trio pull, grab, and smack their strings, scratching and striking the body of the instrument, using it as a resonator. These strange sounds are an intrinsic, inseparable part of the artist's sound and I am struck by comparisons with the work of uh, contemporary modernist composer Helmut Lackenmann, who has a concept of what he calls musique concrète instrumentale, drawing new possibilities of sound production from traditional instruments, fo focusing attention on their means of production. The singing instrumental tone, which Lackenmann regards as domesticated by tradition, is replaced by the detritus of sonic phenomena, toneless sounds, mostly breathing from wind instruments and grinding and scraping of the strings. Okay, now I'm moving on to the section Defending an Aesthetics of Imperfection. Aesthetics of imperfection is not meant to imply a deficiency or failing of improvisation, but Zimmerlin's response, his critical response, uh, that I opened with, suggests a continuing hidden bias, perhaps. At its best, uh, the form of an improvised piece is as convincing as that of a best composition, but it is approached from a different perspective and not as a matter of something that is more or less well formed. Now I think it's necessary to reiterate that the interpretation of composed works has or ought to have essential affinities with improvised performance, and I think this is a neglected issue. And this partly arises from the uh, continuing divide between improvisers and interpreters of composed music, even though that divide is much less than it was, say, 30, 40 years ago. Improvising percussionist Sylvain Darifourc remarks that improvised music should sound like it is composed. I would add, and vice versa. The structure of the resulting position should be a familiar one, although I don't know that it's familiar enough. It is, for instance, the structure that Kant presents with respect to art and nature, when he comments that nature is beautiful because it looks like art, and art can only be called beautiful if we are conscious of it as art, while yet it looks like nature. That's a quote from the Critique of Judgment. Um, and I'm sure the, this is a connected issue. Um, nature and art, improvisation and composition. This interdependence is apparent when one considers the idea of music as a kind of thinking in sounds. That's the view defended uh, by Zimmerlin, and I also uh, defended it, though not at great length, in my uh, monograph, Aesthetics in Music. I think Zimmerlin is in general correct, but his understanding is a little narrow, because the description thinking in sounds applies to the act of composition as well as the performance of improvised music. Consider Brahms's comment that no one can do Mozart's Don Giovanni right for me, I enjoy it much better from the score. Evidently, he heard the work in his head while he read the score. Presumably, presumably also, he was thinking in sound. So, presumably, he was thinking in sound while listening, and also while he was composing himself. Thinking in sounds does not imply that music involves its own kind of thinking in words. Thinking in sounds is not notational. It does not imply content in the sense of propositional content, 
and it is opposed to a linguistic model of music. I mean, that is a um, fundamental point. That is the way that music used to be conceived well, almost universally, probably up to the 18th century. Then the language of emotions became more um, popular, but it's still a very common conception of music. This is not to deny that vocal music is a fundamental form and singing is as fundamental as speaking. Uh, I'm thinking here of Mythen's uh, singing Neanderthals. Mythen claims that although Neanderthals had the kind of vocal tract and respiratory control that could have enabled speech, the neural circuitry for language was not present in them. Uh, despite this fact, they developed a music-like communication system as he puts it, that was more complex and more sophisticated than that found in any of the previous species of Homo, one that included iconic gestures, dance, onomatopoeia, vocal imitation and sound synesthesia. Thus, Maiden appreciates and stresses that music typically includes bodily movement, toe tapping, head nodding, hand clapping and dance, and that music making is first and foremost a shared activity not just in the modern Western world, but throughout human cultures and, and history. Now, it follows from these consider from those considerations that, um, that are stressed by Mythen that um, to think of music as thinking in sounds requires qualification and development to acknowledge the multimodal nature of musical experience. Music is fundamentally an oral art, According to many writers, I think they're wrong in this, it's the only genuine oral art, I think there are other oral arts, but I think music is not just sounds. According to what I call the, mu the movement criterion, uh, the listener is disposed to move to the music, and musicians and audience share a rhythmic dance-like response. This is not merely a causal connection, but a manifestation of musical understanding, as well as involvement and participation. On this view, there is an internal relation between music and movement. As Ezra Pound commented, music begins to atrophy when it departs too far from the dance. Poetry begins to atrophy when it gets too far from music. Music, dance and poetry originated as an integrated practice. So thinking in sounds should perhaps be rephrased as thinking in sounds and movement. Okay, well that's uh, one set of considerations that I want to raise in connection with um, criticism of the notion of the aesthetics of imperfection. Um, and there's much more to be said about the notion of thinking in sounds. But I want to move on, uh, probably at insufficient length, to talk about the notion of a finished work. And this is something that um, Zimmerlin is obviously uh, takes exception to, the idea that an improvised performance is in some sense, unfinished or incomplete. And um, I think actually his objection raises some fundamental issues that I need to think about more. But what I will say is that the concept of an artwork, I think, um, appears along with art with a capital A. Uh, this is autonomous art in a public arena, something placed before the public that normally has a unique, identifiable, named creator or at least a limited partnership of such creators. The idea of a product being finished um, is an ancient one, but it does not imply an artwork in a full sense, because only in the modern era does completion imply placing in a public arena. Because I think only in the modern era is there such a public arena where art uh, is consumed by uh, a public not, on the whole, known uh, to the artist. Obviously, they, the artist may know some members of that public um, and they may predict what kind of people are going to turn up and you know, be the audience. But in general, it's an anonymous um, fee-paying or ticket-paying um, audience that the artwork is being presented to. And it's the fact of it being presented in that way that uh, enables us to refer to the notion of the finished work in this modern sense. Um, the most that one could say uh, concerning 
appeared before the modern era, I'm talking about in the West, before the Renaissance. Uh, the most one could say is that products were placed in a private arena, if arena is the correct word, you know, in the, in the uh, residence of an aristocrat or a church patron or in a church or something, uh, which, okay, a uh, church would be a semi-public arena. Or else we're not properly in an arena at all, but with a subsidiary element in some non-artistic activity, religious, military, or otherwise, or whatever. So we are talking here about non-autonomous or heteronomous art, and the results are perhaps describable as a work, but if so, maybe work with a small w to go with art with a small a. An artwork in its full sense, therefore, is something presented to the public. The idea of a work is conceptually interdependent with the public sphere of artistic production and performance. And you can see that, that you know, we're, we're then opening the uh, discussion up to a very wide range of concepts uh, that take us beyond um, the artistic, uh, I mean, cultural in, in, in a broad and general sense. In this context, finished work implies or means presented to the public, or maybe one would say fit to be so presented. And in this sense, a performance of improvised music is finished. It cannot be withdrawn, as a composed work perhaps can be, uh, and, uh, and youthful compositions often are by the mature composer. I mean, obviously, obviously this depends on whether there are recordings, who has the recordings, whether there have been performances of the composition and so on. But, you know, this is not an uncommon situation that a mature composer would withdraw earlier work that uh, perhaps um, has been uh, enjoyed some existence in a public arena. So obviously that's a, this is a major issue on which, on which much more needs to be said and um, I imagine in the discussion that follows, which we hope to have on Skype, if the god of Skype uh, permits it, uh, no doubt this issue will come up. I'm going to conclude uh, with some comments on um, the artistic implications of an aesthetics of imperfection. I just want to check how many more minutes we've got here, actually. Good, okay. Well, this is doing quite well, then. Huh? Okay. That was seven minutes, by the way. Can I take us up to 25 minutes? Uh, well, I don't think I'll need all of those seven minutes. And it's quite hard to actually present a paper when there's no audience, no audience reaction, no sign of any questions, no fidgeting, and anything like that. So I must say, I think this is probably uh, the best I could do in the circumstances. <laughs> so I'm going to conclude with uh, a few comments about the art music of improvisation that is known as jazz. And I want to conclude with some comments on how the status of jazz as a classical music, which I think it is, rests in part on its aesthetics of improvisation. So I have argued in a fairly obscure location, which I need to make less obscure, that um, the description of jazz as a classical music, as jazz as classical music, I mean, it is relatively often referred to uh, America's classical music, and then there is often a considerable protest to that description. I think the description of jazz as classical is benign, and that the process of classicization has been a largely beneficial one. So you'll gather from this, or you'll be able to infer from this, that I don't regard uh, Winter Marsalis as the Antichrist or anything like that. It doesn't mean I totally agree with everything he does or says, but I think on the whole his influence is benign, and he is a kind of figure that is involved in this process of classicization of an aesthetic of imperfection. Um, jazz and other improvised musics do not need to be legitimated in a practical as opposed to a philosophical sense. I'm not suggesting that that any actual need for legitimation. Uh, it's just that as philosophers, obviously, we adopt perhaps a sceptical stance. And um, so then, the, as Kant noted, you know, leg legitimation is an appropriate kind of activity. What is in question is not whether the music has artistic value, but how that value arises. That's a Kantian question. And I think Ted Joy is right to assume that in contrast to Western art music, jazz's artistic value arises in part, at least, from its status as improvised music. On this view, spontaneity implies authenticity, and it makes sense to talk of preparation for the spontaneous effort. This is uh, what Lee Konitz calls his way of preparation to not be prepared. So, according to Konitz, 
uh, he is, in his practicing, preparing himself to not be prepared and to create, you know, on that basis, it's quite spontaneously. And Konitz, uh, as he said, has complete faith in the spontaneous process. And that's something you need to have in order to attempt this activity of being uh, a jazz improviser pursuing the aesthetics of imperfection in a, in, 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 a, in a serious way. A purist version of the aesthetics of imperfection asserts essential differences between jazz and Western art music. But there are also growing similarities arising from the developed artistry of jazz, which means that it can be described as an imperfectionist art music. In jazz, an aesthetics of imperfection expressed through improvisation allows popular materials to achieve art music status. In its early decades, jazz was an offshoot of the entertainment industry and used its materials. And it still is, in some sense. Uh, offshoot is perhaps too, not quite the right word, but it is certainly, you know, has, retains intimate connections with the entertainment industry. Uh, jazz players later develop lost, loftier aspirations. I mean, actually, there are some people who think that... Uh, Everything maintains connections with the entertainment industry, even the academic world, but I think that might be pushing it a bit far. As we've seen, uh, well, we actually, we haven't seen it because um, I haven't mentioned this, but uh, I will need to mention this in the uh, longer version of this paper because it's pretty brief, this one. Uh, some writers distinguish a classical art that involves restoration from a living art that involves novelty and innovation. On their view, Creativity and interpretation of a classic is the limited kind that reenacts or reanimates. This is a misguided account of many classical performing arts, I believe, and this connects with certain remarks I made earlier about um, the importance of an aesthetics of imperfection in the case of um, the interpretation of composed works. Interpretation is neither mechanical reproduction nor restoration, as in the case of painting or architecture. Of course, there are different approaches, as there are in the restoration of paintings, but no pristine or authentic performance is possible. The performing arts are inexhaustibly interpretable. It would be wrong sharply to separate classical arts and living arts, therefore. Against uh, James Parakelis's interesting assumption that classical and new music are separate practices, they may form a continuum, I think, thus further undermining the rigid demarcation between classical and living arts. In performance, the era of common practice endures both for Western art music and jazz, I believe. These musics aspire to exist in a common present as a living art. Classical exemplars offer inspiration rather than rigid templates. The dialectic between aesthetic perfectionism and imperfection recurs, therefore. Improvisation in jazz is um, perfectionist in its affinities with Western art music, while interpretation in Western art music is imperfectionist in its affinities with improvisation. Is that less than a minute we've got? Or one minute, okay. Right. But improvisation imposes limits on classical perfectionism in jazz. Recordings such as A Love Supreme or Mingus Ah Um are rightly described as classics, Concert recreations of a love supreme reconstruct but cannot re replicate the recording. Jazz's nature as an improviser's rather than an interpreter's art informs its classical status because improvisation is an expression of performer's creativity. In improvisation, the performer rather than the composer is the primary creator. In interpreted music, the, the composer is the primary creator and the performer is secondary, though still creative. This fact sets limits to the classicization of improvised music. In jazz, the superiority of spontaneous creation over prepared solos began to be stressed at the same time during the transition from swing to bebop. Improvisation became valued in jazz as the music was gaining an identity beyond the realm of entertainment and commercial modification. This fact then supports the suggestion that jazz is an art music of improvisation. Well, I think we've come to the end of the 25 minutes virtually, or 24 minutes, 30 seconds. So I look forward to your questions. Uh, thanks a lot.